everyone. Uh, we just got out of the theater, out of the Royville movie house. We watched the first Lord of the Rings movie, The Fellowship of the Ring. It is one of the top 50 best movies of all time. Uh, our popcorn's done, so we're going to talk about it. All right, so The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, was released in 2001. Um, the synopsis on IMDb states, it is a, uh, states, a meek hobbit from the Shire and eight companions set out on a journey to destroy the powerful One Ring and save Middle-earth from the Dark Lord Sauron. Um, this movie was directed by Peter Jackson. And written, um, well, based on the novel by J.R.R. Tolkien, written, uh, screenplay was written by Fran Walsh, Philippa Boyens, and Peter Jackson. And it does star, please excuse us, we just need to get through all this paperwork first. <laughs> it stars Sean Astin, Sean Bean, <clears throat> Kate Blanchett, Orlando Bloom, Billy Boyd, <clears throat> excuse me, Ian Holm, Christopher Lee, Andy Circus as a voice only, Ian McKellen, Peter McKenzie, Sarah McLeod, uh, Sarah McLeod, sorry, Dominic Monaghan, Vigo Morganson, and John Reese Davis, Liv Taylor, and Elijah Wood. All right, so we just got out. This is a movie that Steve and I have watched more than once. Um, in fact, we own a copy of this plus the other two. I do also believe that um, this is the only movie from this trilogy that is on the American Film Institute's uh, Top 100. And I believe it's there to represent all three. But we will only talk about the one that made it on the list. Uh, which is this one. So, well, I'll just ask you, what do you think, first of all? I, uh, obviously, I own the movie, so I liked it. We did watch the extended version. I have the four-disc set, so we watched the first two discs of that set, uh, because the movie is the first disc, then the intermission, then the second disc. Uh, once again, I really liked the movie. I I think the movie, to me, feels like watching someone's dream or watching a dream. The way they use the camera, everything kind of feels, especially when the elves are around, kind of feels like there's this brightness, there's this bright and shadow kind of happening. You can't really see it on the grand running scenes because that's half of the movie, uh, the grand running scenes. But there is definitely this kind of otherworldly direction that I think they specifically put in the movie to kind of give it that otherworldly feel. And how did you think? What did you think of the movie? Well, I agree with all that. I need to preface anything that I say here with I have never been able to finish Fellowship of the Ring, let alone The Two Towers or Return of the King. A lot of you, a lot of all 12 of you, will probably ask me to turn in my geek card here. I do not like the writing styles of J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, I find it very cumbersome, um, but... What I do like about J.R.R. Tolkien is the attention that he pays to his characters within the plot when he's paying attention to those characters. Part of the reason I don't like his writing style is he is building a world, which I can appreciate, but he spends a lot of time on language and he spends a lot of time on landscape. He doesn't spend as much time on races and societies, but he spends some on that and he spends even less time with the actual characters. Which is actually pretty funny because you'll read 40 pages of The Fellowship of the Ring and it'll be literally 30 seconds in the movie as they're running across a field or running into a forest. 
which is actually, I think, why I have enjoyed these movies. Um, I turned to you in the middle of this specific watching and said, I want to be in New Zealand right now. They did a fantastic job of utilizing the scenery of the location that they were at. Most of this film was filmed, if it wasn't on a soundstage in order to be CGI'd up later, the outdoor scenes and many of the big sweeping landscapes in the Shire, they were all in New Zealand. And man, but you can see that that's a beautiful country. Um, they just made it a centerpiece to the movie and it was beautiful. Um, the other thing that I do enjoy about specifically these movies, and like I said, I cannot speak to the books because I haven't finished them. Eventually, hopefully, but I just haven't done that yet. Um, is the overall message that Peter Jackson um, utilized in Peter Jackson and the other writers? Um, they utilized a lot of the same sort of themes that really hit you hard in an epic story, in an epic journey story, where it was the the underdogs, there were nine of them, and they fought off an entire army, not only of goblins in the Mines of Moria, is that right? Correct. Yep, the Mines of Moria. Um, but an army of orcs right off the shores of the river, right before Sam and Frodo go off to go to Mordor. Oh, by the way, spoilers if you have not seen uh, a movie that's been out for more than probably 15 years. Well, it was but spoil spoilers nonetheless. Sorry, my apologies. Um, he hit all of the notes that were supposed to pull in your heartstrings and make you pull for these underdogs. The hobbits are pure of heart and just want to eat and smoke their tobacco and drink their ale. Except for Frodo and Sam, who are the centerpiece of the film. Their friendship is actually the main point of this film. Um, Frodo is tasked with taking the One Ring, the evil ring, to Mordor, to Mount Doom, which is appropriately named, to throw it into the volcano and destroy this ring and take that specific evil uh, that... Lord Sauron can peek into the world and take over. <clears throat> I I must say that if you know what we do on the channel, if you have listened to some of our other videos, audios, you know that I am a big fan of role playing. I have been playing Dungeons and Dragons the uh, before it was cool to some people, for a long time. And this movie, one of the reasons I love this movie so much is it hits all of those fantasy buttons. I'm not a huge reader. Um, I actually read rather slowly. So watching movies is kind of my outlet for stuff like that. I do like character studies, but the thing about this movie that I love is that it is a phenomenal fantasy film. You just love, and yes, it's based off of a book, but if you're taking that out of it and just doing, just looking at it as if you just watch the movie, there are so many things to love about this movie as a fantasy and as an adventure. The... The excitements of the battles are very... You, you think that the characters are in the pitched battle uh, for their lives. The names of the places are great fun to say. I told that to Ellen earlier. Rivendell, Isengard, the Mines of Moria. I mean, it just, it just evokes that feel of fantasy and excitement to me. And for me, um, it's not high fantasy, which actually is okay with me. Um, I have discovered that the, what you call high fantasy, wizards and swords and paladins and chosen ones, which yes, this is a chosen one story, but um, Dragonlance is not my cup of tea. How about that? 
Dragonlance being a setting of high fantasy for Dungeons and Dragons, which I actually uh, played as a character in a friend's long-standing Dragonlance game. I'm not a big high fantasy person. Um, however, um, I am okay with some magic, like magical items, some people having some magical ability. Um, <clears throat> I prefer the look and aesthetic of it with a really good character play in it. That being said, let's talk about the characters. Let's start with Gandalf. Gandalf the Grey is a wizard. Great friends to Bilbo and Frodo Baggins. He is played by Ian McKellen in this particular incarnation. And I happen to think that even though he's not a villain and very obviously not a villain, upon this like millionth time of seeing this movie, I happen to think that he's kind of a jerk. He doesn't talk about what he knows. He keeps his secrets, which is a big meme. All right, keep your secrets. But he keeps these secrets until the very last minute when maybe like another hour or day that he knew the information could have helped the people who are actually on the journey. It doesn't make any sense to me. He's just kind of like a plot device and he's not that great of a friend. He basically set it up so that Frodo would have to pick up the ring rather than him because he doesn't, granted, he doesn't trust himself with it, but why in the world would he trust another being with it? He just let it sit on the floor until Frodo came in where, he let it sit on the floor where Bilbo dumped it. Well, he couldn't touch it though. Why couldn't he? Like all the rest of them could touch it. Yeah, but the whole thing was that if you touch it, it might it might take control of you. That was a big thing. Like, he let it sit there because if he touched it, he would want to keep it. He would want to possess it. So, That's why when Frodo was giving it back to him, he made sure that he had the envelope open and then quickly sealed it up. I know that. However, why is it okay for Frodo to possibly have sorry about that folks <laughs> why is it okay for frodo to possibly have the ring take him over and not okay for gandalf to possibly have the ring take him over well first of all chosen one second of all i think it's because of the innocence of the hobbits that actually allows frodo it in a wider scale yes but actually allows frodo to be able to do this because everybody else, especially rewatching this movie, everyone else has a huge problem with that ring. Even Aragorn, who is put up as almost a, a person of virtue, has a problem with the, with the ring. And because in the last scene where Frodo and Aragorn are together, He's, you can tell by the way Viggo Mortensen plays it that Aragorn wants the ring, but only with great will is he able to close Frodo's hand and say, go, you have to leave us. I understand you have to leave us because I want the ring as well. I might be reading into it a little bit, but that's where I got from that scene. And that's why nobody else can touch this thing. All right. Does it change the fact that he's kind of a jerk, though? Uh, he is. I mean, I, I'm i very into fantasy genres, though, and he's basically the archmage, the archwizard, that kind of knows everything and is giving the, the people a quest. And in knowing everything, he's... Yeah, he's kind of a dick in that way. All right. I'll 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 give that to you. Okay. Um, but okay. then again, I mean, him doing that might have, giving them too much information, now granted this might be the wrong way to say it, but giving them too much information might lead them astray. He is along for the ride, 
But like I said when we were watching the movie, he kind of seems like he's along for the ride. He is the quest giver, as is a trope of fantasy literature and movies. He is the quest giver. But once that happens, the characters, the adventurers, the Frodo and Aragorn and Legolas are the ones that he has make the decisions. That is true. Um, he did turn to, when they were trying to figure out whether to go through the minds of Moria or through uh, the name of the kingdom that Boromir is from, I completely just blanked just now. Gondor? Gondor. Yes. Um, so he turned to Frodo and said, let the ring bearer make the decision. And yeah, he did not make any decisions. In fact, he didn't even solve the riddle. He's supposed to be really smart. Right. Um, so, that being said, uh, Ian McKellen did a fantastic job. As always, I don't think Ian McKellen does bad work, like, ever. Pulling it away from one actor, I think everyone did a great job. And I thought <laughs> that all of the characters, whether they look exactly like what they're supposed to in the book, all of the characters, I thought, for the movie, really fit... Uh, sorry... All of the actors, I thought, for the movie really fit their parts. I could see those actors, the way they portrayed them, the way they look. I could see those people as those characters. Whether they are in the books, the way they are in the movie, what they are in the movie, I could really see it. So, let's... Um, what about... So we talked about Frodo a little bit. We talked about Aragorn. We talked about Gandalf. And we talked about Sam. Did you talk about Sam a little no, bit? No, I All haven't. Right. We haven't talked. In, we, we've just mentioned Frodo and Sam. And True. We'll talk about Sam. I mean, obviously, Frodo is kind of the instrument uh, to me. He's the chosen one. Yeah, everything kind of revolves around him. To me, honestly, Frodo is probably the least interesting character in the movie. Now, that could be different for Ellen, but that's just my opinion. Um, Frodo's played by Elijah Wood, and actually he does a really good job, and he's much more interesting at the very beginning of the movie than when he finds the ring. I find him to be charming and fun, just like the rest of the population of the Shire. Uh, they like their, their food and their ale and their tobacco and he's great friends with Gandalf and he loves his uncle Bilbo and then Bilbo leaves him the estate including the ring and suddenly he becomes super serious I mean yeah he laughs a little bit but he is incredibly serious through the rest of the movie I don't find him all that interesting because as you said he's more of the instrument of Again, just to a lesser degree, he's sort of like Gandalf. He's an instrument of the plot. He's no longer a, he's no longer a character that I can see as having free will anymore once he becomes the bearer of the ring. All right, and what do you think about Sam? Samwise Ganji. Samwise Ganji, I think, is the thing that completes Frodo. So, Sean Astin plays Samwise Ganji, uh, Rudy, or the spoiled kid from Encino Man. But he does this fantastic job of playing Samwise Ganji, who is a good friend of Frodo's from the Shire, who, for whatever reason, decides that he's going to eavesdrop on Gandalf and Frodo's conversation about the ring. And because of it, Gandalf hooks him into going on this adventure and makes him promise. He makes a promise. Don't you lose him, Samwise Ganji. <laughs> and so because of that, the centerpiece of the entire trilogy becomes the friendship and support um, that Frodo and Sam have for each other. Sam specifically being the hero of the entire thing, in my opinion. But we don't need to get into that because those are in other movies. That's just my opinion. I find Sam to be probably one of the most fun and compelling characters because he is so 
coming. He's so down to earth, I guess, is the he's so he's just a simple man. Yeah, I do I do like Sam. I consider him probably kind of the audience of the group. Um, I consider him me <laughs> if I was uh, in the adventure. However, uh, that being said, Legolas to me and Gimli to me in this movie, in this part. Now, granted, this doesn't have anything to do with how they evolve in the other two movies. But to me, they're the elf and the dwarf in the adventuring party. There's not really a lot for them besides kind of moving along and saying, he will have my bow and he will have my axe. And then they just kind of go along with the adventure. There's a little bit with Legolas when they see elves because he's the elf. There's a little bit with Gimli. I think Gimli, correct? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I'm getting the name right. Uh, there's a little bit with Gimli when they're in the mines of Moria, but once again, because he's the dwarf. So, that being said, I did really love the actor's performances. I really love the actor that plays Gimli. However, there isn't much to unbox there for me. Ellen, agree, disagree? I agree. Um, John Reese davis and uh, Orlando Bloom did a great job, but they didn't have a whole lot to work with in this specific movie. The stuff that they had to work with comes in the next two, as far as character studies of those two characters. Um, because, spoilers, they split the party at the very end of this movie, so they have enough time to kind of focus on one set of characters and then Sam and Frodo. In future movies. But in this specific movie, Legolas and Gimli, they're the, the the dwarf and the, well, they're the fighter barbarian type thing and an archer. Like, if you want to take it to D&D sorts of terms. Well, if Dungeons and Dragons took it from Lord of the Rings. Oh, correct. So that leads us to two of the last three characters that I think uh, we should talk about. Merry and Pippin, who are the other two hobbits of the four hobbits in the Fellowship. I really, really like those characters. They are great comic relief. I think that the actors do a great job and have and help the audience to have fun with it. You can kind of see, though, even from the beginning of the movie to the end of this first movie in the trilogy, that they're starting to grow. They're starting to change. I think more even than Sam. And yes, there's a huge change in Frodo, but I think that's because of the ring, not because of real character development. Um, I think so mostly Mary as well. Actually, if I remember right, I have a hard time keeping straight. <clears throat> I have a hard time keeping straight who's Pippin and who's Mary. Ah, <laughs> yeah, um, true. Me, t me as well. But Mary, I believe, is the one who starts to find his courage earlier than Pippin, if I remember right. And I know I just got done watching it. I'm just saying I have a hard time. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the cast list with pictures. I'm still having a hard time visualizing which character I'm thinking of. <laughs> so I apologize. Anyway. All right. And then unless there's anything more for those two Hobbits characters, I think for me, the last character and probably the most interesting character uh, played by Sean Bean is Boromir. So what does Ellen think about Boromir? Boromir is the devil's advocate in the Fellowship, pretty much from the get-go. He wants to use the ring, because if he's able to use the ring, it would be for good. I would only use it for good, which is a common theme in a lot of fantasy and sci-fi, where something evil comes about, some evil object, whether it be magic or science or abilities of some sort, and one of the one of the heroes inevitably is like, well, I can use this because my intentions are good. 
but this thing has absolute power which will corrupt absolutely and so through the whole thing he is struggling because he's trying to reach out to Aragorn who is heir to the throne of Gondor. Gandor, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Who is heir to the king the king uh, the kingdom of man actually. It, it's the biggest kingdom in the in the world of man. He is a direct descendant of the king who actually took the ring to begin with and refused to destroy it. And so Boromir is just reaching out because he is he's grown up seeing his kingdom his home being stretched thin and being one of the last points of defense between the evil of Mordor and the rest of the world that everybody else is basically profiting off of the blood of his people and then here comes this ring that could possibly make it stop make all of the bloodshed stop and make the kingdom prosper again not to mention, he'll be able to bring home the heir to the throne of... Gondor. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end, he falls victim to the temptation of the ring. And in doing so, he attacks Frodo. I don't know even in his fit if he did if he intended on hurting him or not. I can't tell. I don't think he really did. I think he did, but to me he wasn't in his right mind. Correct. Um he got knocked about the head a little bit in a tumble that he took trying mm -hmm. to attack Frodo. And when he came back to himself, he was definitely very regretful and turned around and in the battle of the big army of orcs that came in he has one of the most epic death scenes I think I've ever seen in a lot of movies. I mean, not just fantasy, not just sci-fi, but any movie is pretty fantastic. He dies defending the lives of Merry and Pippin because Merry and Pippin created a diversion so that Frodo could run away because they were able to see that Frodo needs to leave them. So Boromir kind of redeems himself at the end there. I believe so. I believe he more than just kind of. I think he does redeem himself. I think he sees what the danger is. All right. So those are the main characters. Before we kind of move on to something else about the movie, probably the two last parts I want to talk about uh, for the movie, which would be the actual cinematic special effects and if they hold up, and the music. Is there anything you want to say about any of the other characters, any of the characters, uh, whether they're still part of the Fellowship or side characters in the movie? There are three more characters that I think we would be remiss if we didn't even bring them up. Okay. Which is Sauron, played by Christopher Lee. Galadriel, played by uh, Catherine Blankenshet. Blanchett? That one. Okay. I'm really doing poorly tonight. <laughs> she is not from Gondor, just so you know. <laughs> and then the third one is actually uh, Elron. Elron. Uh, played by the guy from The Matrix. Played by Agent Smith. Yes. And that's all you need to know. <laughs> His name, sorry. His name is Hugo Weaving. My apologies. Also, actually, Liv Tyler um, plays Arwen, who is... We don't have to talk a whole lot about her. She's a plot Basically, device. Basically, at this point, she's a plot device for Aragorn. She's the love interest. Also, save Frodo's life. True. Well, once again, the plot, plot device. device. Yeah. Um, but the other three, actually, are... Sor uh, Soromon, uh, played by Christopher Lee, is the white. He's supposed to be a good wizard... Uh, turns out head of the council. Turns out he's not so much that he's kind of the second big villain, not not Sauron, but he serves Sauron and makes the army of orcs and in, curse his sudden but inevitable betrayal. Correct, um, because Gandalf at the beginning, well, toward the first half of the movie, does go to him for help and gets imprisoned and attacked, and yay. 
which is what brings the Eagles in, but we won't talk about that right now. Um, all right, so that's Soramon. Which Christopher Lee does a great job in the role, I must say. I I had a problem with him when he was in Star Wars, but once again, that might just not be the, him. It might be the character, but he does a great job as Saruman in this movie. All right, so Galadriel is a ring bearer um, of one of the three. Rings of the, yeah, yeah, one, one of, of the, the three rings of the elves. Um, she is basically the high queen of elfdom. I, I don't know how else to describe her. She's very pretty, blonde, beautiful beyond belief. Um, played by Kate Blanchett, who they do a fantastic job making her look ethereal. I don't know if she got her own. I, I'm sure it was CGI. But she got she got her own light. Pretty much, like is what it looked <laughs> she like. Just had sure somebody it's... off stage shining a light on her everywhere she went. Because she looked both front and backlit, like something was <laughs> shining on her from the front and from the back. She glowed. It was pretty fantastic. So she basically also serves as a plot device. Um, she looks really scary because she's tempted, she's tempted to take the ring from Frodo because Frodo says, I'd gladly give it to you. And she doesn't take it, but she does temporarily give in to the temptation, at least in a fantasy sort of sense. But in the long run, she serves also as a plot device in that both of the hobbits get knives of cloaking, I want to say. And they get food from her, and the elf gets a magic bow. The dwarf gets three strands of her hair because she's the most fair she's ever lo- he's ever looked at. Um, Aragorn doesn't get anything because he already has the immortality of Arwen, which is why she's a plot device. Um, Boromir, does he get something from her? Or just a warning? He might just get a warning. I'm not exactly sure. I can't remember. And then Frodo obviously gets encouragement. Right. Um, Sam gets a rope. Yep, Sam gets a rope. Uh, no, actually, Frodo gets um, really cool light water. Oh, that's right. The light, the light, It will shine through the deepest, darkest dark. It is, yeah, he gets perfume... And Sam gets rope, and everybody else gets cool magic items. So, in the terms of the video game of Lord of the Rings, she is the shopkeeper. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, I, she serves more of a purpose, I'm sure, but when you break it down, she's a plot device in order for them to get their magic items, to be able to continue their quest. Um, the third is Elrond. Who is the king of Rivendell. An elf. And Arwen's father. But, again, plot device. But mainly for him, he's a plot device and throwing exposition out there. Specifically to fill in the backstory of Aragorn. Fill in the backstory of Aragorn and to kind of moderate to get the fellowship together. He is a very, actually for an elf, rather not good looking. Everybody else is gorgeous and he's just, he's regal looking, but everybody else is gorgeous. So I don't know. He's got a, that's probably why he's just exposition. (laughs) I I, I hate to say it, but Hugo Weaving is not, he's a striking looking man, but he's not a handsome man. But anyway, so those are the last three characters. All right, CGI. So, obviously, once again, this movie was made about 20 years ago. So it has, our movies have improved on the CGI quite a bit. So there is some lag of the CGI. There are some almost comical kind of... There's a scene where they're all fighting goblins in the mines of Moria. Legolas jumps on a cave troll. And it definitely, to me, looks like I should hit up left, shoot, shoot, um, and jump on my console or on my uh, video game pad. Uh, There's a couple other scenes 
where their group is shown running in uh, most mostly the mines is the area that I had a problem with shows them running and it's very stilted very video gamey there was also oh go ahead Ellen actually but in that same scene the Balrog at the same time looked amazing yes yes even it, still. it looked amazing even to this day so the next thing is now that I know that they use children a lot of the times to show the difference in heights with the hobbits I in watching it this time I could not get that out of my mind so the <laughs> children stunt doubles of the hobbits were something that I saw quite a bit um, but also it made me fascinated by when I didn't think they were using children in placement of the hobbits and how they cinematically made people look taller or look shorter by placement of the camera, placement of the characters. Agreed. The practical effects in the special effects department that had nothing to do with CGI were actually probably better than the CGI effects. Yeah. They were a lot more seamless. Um, Graded, like I said, when we were watching the movie, the facial hair and long hair and bushy eyebrows of the wizards allowed these 70 plus year old men to actually have stunt doubles come in and do a really physical, physical, magical fight between the two of them without breaking a hip. Yes. Anyway. Um, Do you have anything? That's basically what I have to say about the special effects. Other than that, a lot of the fight scenes were still as amazing as I remembered them. The movements, the the swinging of the swords, the the running, the movements of and the costumes for the bad guys, the orcs and the goblins, I think still really worked for this. Do you have anything else to add on that? I thought that um, makeup and costuming were amazing, just like any other period piece. And I know this is not a real quote-unquote period piece, but the costuming is obviously of a medieval bent. And I thought that they did a fantastic job of using costuming to convey not just who the character is, but what station in life he is. Um, I also thought the makeup team was fantastic in making the goblins and orcs and and, uh, other creatures, the elves, they all looked amazing and real to the world that we were looking into. So that's all I have to say. All right. The last major thing I want to discuss is how much I think the music invokes the setting in this movie. The ethereal music that they have. There was a, a comment that Ellen's not really into Enya, but I think the use of Enya, and I like Enya, I guess, um, but the use of Enya in this movie really fit the style and the music, and the music added to what I had said before. I think the music added to the dreamlike aspect of this movie. Whether it was a slow roll when you're seeing the landscape, when it's a very kind of background melody, a background atmospheric music, and then something dark happens, and the music just takes you and pulls you with that darkness. And then when that darkness is over, it just glides you back out of that scene. I just thought that the music was second to none in telling, helping tell the story that this movie is is promoting. I also do like uh, there was, because it was a party for most of the time that they were in the Shire, that the music for the Shire was very Irish-ish. Like there was jigs and there were reels and there were ballad sorts of sounds. Lots of pipes, lots of fun. The Shire was portrayed through music as being a fun place to be. And every time... It was it was good, but had they done it just a little bit more, it would have been to the comical, where 
somebody said something that ha- pertained to the overall lesson of the movie. Like when Gandalf says, the when Frodo says, I wish the ring hadn't come to me. I wish all of this hadn't happened. And then Gandalf looks at him and says, everyone who lives through these times wish that way. And there's this huge sweeping woodwind flute sort of sound going on while he's laying this wisdom on Frodo, which only happens about four times in the movie. So honestly, they didn't overdo it, but one or two more times it would have almost been comical. But that's what's actually great about the score is that they didn't overdo something that could very easily have gone over to the cheesy and comical very easily. And I know they had this huge budget and all of that, but I have seen big budget films that have taken their score and it's been almost ridiculous. So this is great that they didn't do that. And yes, I'm not a big fan of Enya, but May It Be is a fantastic sort of theme to, especially the elf scenes. It's just dreamy and airy and woodsy almost. I don't know how else to to describe the feel of that music but that's yeah i agree all right well i think that's most of what we want to say or almost all of what we want to say about the movie uh ellen is giving me a kind of hold up here so any final thoughts or what What, else you would like to say what do you think see i think the lesson of this specific movie not of the trilogy but the specific movie is what Galadriel says to Frodo, which is no matter how small a person, they can make a change in the world. What do you think? I agree with that. I, okay. I think that that might uh, be an aspect of the movie. But I also think, especially for this one, it's friendship and loyalty. It's friendship and loyalty through Sam. It's friendship and loyalty through... The interaction of the characters of old, like the interaction between Elrond and Gandalf. It's interaction between even Gandalf and Saruman because there's a betrayal there. And what happens when friendship and loyalty is replaced with betrayal. And then friendship and loyalty in the fellowship itself and how that interaction plays with the whole story, the whole taking the ring to Mordor and just basically pushing the movie. So I think, yes, little people, even the smallest person, the most, the person that they think is the most insignificant, even in yourself, if you think you're insignificant, if you decide to do something, you can change the world. I think that is a message, but To me, what stands out through the whole movie is friendship and loyalty. The secondary point of the movie, I believe, is discovering who you are yourself. Aragorn, Boromir, the the Hobbits, they all, through, actually, I, I know it's a long movie, but through a short period of time, because I think the movie takes place over less than a week. It's probably three days. Depending on how fast they run across the landscape. True, but they're walking (laughs) a lot, so I think they probably covered a lot. But less than a week, we'll say. We'll say a week. Just in those seven days, all of the characters are... It's almost like a coming of age, like almost a second coming of age for a lot of them. Like the, The hobbits are all young, so this could be their first coming of age. This is the first time they're leaving the Shire. This is the first time they're facing the world. Uh, This is the first time that anybody's left the Shire, I think, since Bilbo left and came back. So they're almost like children in adult bodies, whereas everybody else has already come of age. And I think they're coming of age again because this big thing is happening. So the secondary theme, I think, is learning yourself. But my mother, I know, would argue this because the main theme for the overarching of all three of these these movies in this trilogy for her is the friendship between Sam and Frodo. Sam saying, "Don't you don't you lose him, Samwise Gamgee." I don't mean to. I Mom, 
is very much a proponent of it's a meme now online get you a sam because samwise ganji is that friend who's always cheerleading you who's always holding you up and that i think is probably the main thing the friendship not necessarily just samwise and frodo but mary and pippin mary forms a friendship later with Boromir's younger brother, who's not in this movie, but there's lots of friendship in the overall story, and the friendship that you forge in adversity ends up being the friendship that you take with you through your whole life. But anyway, that's... Not in this movie. Not Well, that part. Mary and, and <laughs> Boromir's little brother's not in this movie, but the rest of it is. The rest of it's totally in this movie. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> so why do you think it's on AFI's AFI's top 100? Do you think it's this, the CGI? Do you think it's um, the epicness? Do you think it's the writing? I think it's the first real fantasy movie that got such critical acclaim. They felt that if they didn't do it, they would have a mob riot on their hands. Okay. <laughs> this was... Uh... It was very well done, very well acted. It was an epic story told from an epic book that is much loved by people all across the world, and they did it brilliantly. I think that if they didn't get awards for it, then there would be something horribly wrong. Well, AFI, um, not everyone aspired. I think AFI has a lot of critics involved with it and sometimes critics don't always agree with what audience is like so i thought i'd ask you and find out what you think put them on that list because when we're just looking at the list it doesn't say what the reasoning was behind it it just puts it at number 50 it's number 50 on the top 100 so it's halfway up so it's actually pretty high um especially given that it's a fantasy movie true once again <laughs> because a lot of fantasy movies are as entertaining as they may be, Beastmaster and Clash of the Titans, especially the original one, will never be on this list. They're just not that well made. They're fun, but they're not that well made. We'll talk to Ellen uh, off this video about how she's horribly mistaken on those two films. But that's for another time and maybe in private um, <laughs> with a bunch of yelling and screaming from uh, myself. <laughs> So I think that actually kind of ends our discussion of one of the best 50 movies of all time, Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, I was very good, I think, in not discussing this movie totally in terms of a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. If you are interested in that, let us know in the comments and we might do another video because I could not get around it the whole time I was watching the movie. If you like this video or this audio and want to listen to more of them, kind of follow us on our journey through the best and worst films of all time, go ahead and subscribe to Royville, the YouTube channel. Is there anything else, Ellen? If you have, once again, I'm sorry, if you have any comments or discussions uh, about the movie, go ahead and put them in the comments. Ellen, do you have anything else? Nothing more about this movie, but next week we will be watching the bad movie that pairs with this, which is Battlefield Earth, based on a book by L. Ron Hubbard, starring John Travolta. All right, so I'm super excited about that. And that will be it for the evening. Looks like the lamps are being lighted out on the streets. So everyone, until next time, have a good night. Good Thank night. Thank you.